Our scripture verse today comes from 1 Kings 19, verses 1 through 13. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the Lord came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Holy Spirit, I pray that you take my breath and make it yours. In name we pray. Amen. Walk into any library or bookstore, and the first few titles that will scream out to you are the self-help books. You know the kind I'm talking about, right? The kind that in seven steps or less are guaranteed to make you a better person in society. I did a Google search the other day on self-help books, and one of the titles was, You Mean I'm Not Stupid, Crazy, or Lazy? Our society is a doubt-ridden society needing approval of others to verify their self-worth. Forbes published an article that said, Want to get rich? Write a self-help book. But friends, what happens when all those self-help books are read? Every article poured over, every relationship exhausted. What happens when we as individuals are the only ones standing for our beliefs? When even after trying our best to love and live out Stephen Covey's seven highly effective habits, society deems us as inadequate people by covering us with adjectives such as prejudiced, prudish, intolerant, unloving. It's simple enough to stand for Jesus during church services and seminaries. But what happens when others' opinions are sometimes violently disagreeing with us? Will we flee to solitude? Or will we stand with God's word in our hearts, considering the source of the rejection? In today's text, we get a glimpse of our protagonist, Elijah, after killing off the prophets that Queen Jezebel and King Ahab were rooting for. To catch you up to speed, the gap between God and his people has grown significantly, helped by the dangerous duo, Queen Jezebel, and her pushover for a husband, Ahab. Q. Elijah, proclaiming his own name, Elijah in Hebrew, meaning, my God is Jehovah, or the Lord is my God. Without any hesitation, Elijah is immediately in King Ahab's face, reaming him for his godlessness. Elijah stood alone in the gap, tough in a vulnerable position. He stood in the gap between 400 prophets of Baal and Yahweh's altar, soaking the altar with his faith and confidence in Yahweh by the form of water. He fought through his own feelings of inadequacy with God's overwhelming power and defeated Baal. After hearing all about the big showdown, Jezebel is predictably furious. And in verse 2, pulls a Vito Corleone short of the cotton balls and horse head and says, by this time tomorrow, I'm going to have you killed. Although Elijah was a man of integrity and humility, he booked it out of Dodge. Why was Elijah so intimidated and fearful to the point of camping out in the wilderness in the cave? He wasn't thinking clearly, friends. If he would have thought through the situation, he would have realized this threat didn't come from God, but came from an overbearing, carnal woman who didn't live a life following God. He was thinking solely on human terms. It's like that bully in middle school who looks all big and bad with their threats to punch you in the face after school. 
but you don't realize that your mom is the one that picks you right outside the school gates. So you rush through the hallways into your locker, shut the locker door, and your mother comes, opens the locker door, comically puzzling, puzzled, asks you, what are you doing here, sweetheart? Elijah wasn't considering the source and was using that fear to rule his actions, inhibiting him from fulfilling God's plan. He was his own prisoner, slamming shut the locker doors of his own heart, wanting to completely give up. While God understood Elijah's fear, he still used his football coach voice to slice through his self-pity and to say, what in the world are you doing here, Elijah? Get back in the game. They've got nothing on us. Another guy's story could have been one of inadequacy. He traded a place of glory and no pain, no limits for a fully human body experiencing pain, hunger, and loneliness. From womb to tomb, Christ was born in an inadequate space, in an inadequate town, to inadequate parents. He lived among those deemed spiritually and physically inadequate to society and died an inadequate death, a death shared by two thieves on a tree representing the sin for which he died. Christ was asked several times by his enemies the same question asked of Elijah by God, but with different connotations. Amongst the rocks, hunger, and tiredness, Satan asked Christ, what are you doing here? Amongst the thieves, hunger, and tiredness, the people that taunted Christ, what are you doing here? Those questions were answered not by a thrashing wind or mind-blowing explosions, but by a quiet perseverance in faith and focus on Yahweh, an understanding that it doesn't matter how many threats, taunts, or terrible names are thrown at us, but that as Paul writes in Romans 8, if God is for us, who could be against us? Hunger is not satisfied by turning stones to bread. Spreading God's word and fulfilling his will is not satisfied by dying alone in a cave, and God's wrath for our sins would not have been satisfied by dying of old age in a warm bed. In verse 9, he wasn't degrading Elijah like Christ's enemies did him. He wasn't calling him stupid or saying he shouldn't be feeling that way. God fed him physically and was encouraging him spiritually by saying in verses 11 and 12 to get out of that depressing cave and into the light and focus on him. The truth is, friends, we are inadequate. But it is how we view our inadequacy that makes the difference. Satan whispers we can't do anything. And that's just another half-truth. Without God, we can do nothing. Friends, without God, we are nothing. There is no self-help book to fill the nothingness that only God can fill. But the wonderful thing about living a life full in Christ is that he is the ultimate leveler. Whether you were born and spent your life in a box built from cardboard or marble, whether you had two loving parents who moved out when you were 16, we have a creator who saw us as good, as adequate, as worthy of dying for. God doesn't care about the amount of Christmas presents you're able to put under the tree for your kids, the grades you got last semester, or the number of likes you got on your last Facebook status. As seen especially in Elijah's feelings of inadequacy, God doesn't care about how we measure up to all those who came before us and all those who go after us. God's cares are found in us being vessels for his plan, for showing his love to others through love and executing every action, every word from nothing but love. What are we doing here? Are we as a church dwelling on our own obvious inadequacy? Or are we dwelling on God's eternal provision? Are we concerned about the amount of people who are against us or God's complete and unshakable love? Without God, both being completely inadequate and people being against us will be true. But with God, only one will be true. And if we are living completely through the breath of the Holy Spirit, the like-mindedness of Christ, and the will of the Father, those who are against us will cease to make us tremble because we have a God who has already overcome them. If we are following God like Elijah, there is no question his adversaries will hate us. As Paul writes to the Corinthians, we smell like a contagious dead person to those who are dying, but we smell like the fountain of life to those who are being saved. Who are we allowing to dictate our actions and worth? 
If we keep allowing the adversary to dictate our actions, how are we ever going to be useful vessels for God? What are we doing here? Are we giving up control and our own self-pity, or are we just as happy conveniently wallowing in and hiding from worldly threats? It's natural to hit rock bottom in despair. Others experience the same feelings. Moses, Jonah, Paul, even Christ. But it is where you go from there that matters. Since we can't always avoid these caves, some of the ways to learn is not through the earthquakes or fires, but in the sheer stillness of solitude. Friends, we need to stop setting our expectations on what God would and should work and work on listening to the many ways in which he could. Next, develop the understanding that until Christ comes again, we as his people will be scattered and will live among unbelievers. But as Dietrich Bonhoeffer explains, it will be those believers that will be the seed of the kingdom in all the world. How are we to be good fruit-producing seeds if we stay in the holes in which we are planted? Pushing oneself to live in Christian community whenever possible will help close the gap of feeling all alone, and God's word will be spoken to fill any outstanding holes. Mm -hmm. Friends, Christian communities are blessings. They are the rocks from which we build our sturdy homes, the body that belongs to the head, the cornerstone, the Christ. They are the miracle grow in the garden that is the world. God doesn't hide the weaknesses of his people in scriptures for a purpose. They were people. They messed up. They felt discouraged. But he makes it clear that he is the only self-help book that will push us out of the caves in which we imprison ourselves and into the light of his presence. Friends, when all are seemingly against us and we stand in the gap of vulnerability, we must give up full control for there is no quick fix. Being a Christian isn't always convenient. It's not always comfortable. There's only one promise and that's of God's complete trustworthiness and love. Amen.